One advantage of using inquiry approaches to laboratories is that they change the level of student engagement in the experiment that they're conducting. Now, I don't know if this has happened to you because we're obviously not talking face to face here, but many teachers that I've met at conferences and workshops nod their heads when I share stories where I've had a perfectly detailed laboratory procedure and the students have absolutely no idea what they're doing or why they're doing it. Um, early on in my career, I would actually have to tame my frustration when students would ask, what do we do next? I actually got to the point once that I would just point to the next procedural step on their sheet of paper and say, what does step four say to do? It was obvious to me that the students had not read the lab procedure prior to coming into class, so I faulted them entirely for being unprepared. It never actually occurred to me that students might very well have read the procedure, but because it had absolutely no meaning to them, they read the words and promptly forgot most of them. So when we look at laboratory procedure, already having learned chemistry, we can tell what each step was designed to do. When students are just starting out in chemistry, though, they need a lot of context before established procedures will necessarily make sense to them. I've had more than one experience where I've given students a procedure, observed them make a really illogical step, and then I ask them why they're doing that. And if they can't respond, I then usually follow up like, well, what are you trying to do in this lab? And if they can't even answer that question, I realized that I hadn't appropriately prepared my class for conducting that experiment. So I want you to think back to your own high school chemistry education for a few moments, and I want you to think about what was memorable. I'm actually gonna pause here for an awkwardly long time, and I'm actually gonna let you think it through for a minute. So did you notice any patterns in your memory? By the way, um, the reason I waited that long, I did a seven second count in my head. Most of the studies on wait time say that if you're gonna ask your students a question, make sure you give seven seconds of think time before they bring things to light and before you start fielding questions from the class. It feels really awkwardly long and I've been doing it for several years and it still feels really awkwardly long, but I would encourage you to give that time for kids to really digest and dig into their memories. But I want you to dig into yours. Did you notice patterns about what you remembered from your high school chemistry class? I am guessing, I don't know, we don't have a conversation here, but you probably remember the things that you put an awful lot of effort into figuring out. You probably remember times that you were allowed to collaborate with your classmates in the, either in the laboratory or in the classroom. But you probably don't remember the labs that had 20 different steps that were incredibly detailed established procedures. They're probably not that memorable unless something super surprising happened at the end of the experiment. For me personally, there's two labs that I remember from my interchemistry class in high school. The first one was where we had to make observations, and it was only observations, of watching a candle burn. And we discussed as a class, we all shared our results and what we observed, and we had to actually separate what was observation and what was inference or conclusion. Um, it stood out to me because I found out what I wrote down on my sheet of paper was actually mostly inference and observation and very little, uh, mostly inference, very little observation. It was actually by being repeatedly wrong as I was watching all of the stuff that my peers were saying that I learned the difference between observation and inference. The other lab that stood out to me most was making a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate and then observing what happens when you place a seed crystal into the solution that we had prepared. Um, that last experiment stood out because as a class we had expressed interest in seeing a supersaturated solution after our teacher lectured to us about the possibilities of saturation and supersaturation. We were really curious and we wanted to see what would happen. So rather than actually doing a demonstration for us, our teacher said that he would find a laboratory procedure. It was actually one of the greatest labs we had done that year because our curiosity was peaked before we began the lab. We weren't just doing the lab because it fit into the curriculum, we were doing the lab because we wanted to actually do this. If we think of lab sort of like a mystery novel, what information do your students need to make the experiment worth doing? What's gonna make them curious enough to investigate this case? Science is really all about curious people trying to find clues to unravel the mysteries of the world. Don't destroy the mystery for, of chemistry for your students by just giving them the answer right away. So many teachers that I meet share stories of students who lack engagement in chemistry. And while student motivation is a subject unto itself, we could build a whole nother video series just on that. I don't think that we rope a lot of kids into the magic of chemistry when we give them formulaic procedures for every single lab.
If you bring students into the brainstorming process, get them to ask questions. Um, what would happen if? Questions are great ones that can be answered in the laboratory. But if students are actively involved in determining what they will investigate in the laboratory, or if they help develop the procedure, they're going to have a much more vested interest in conducting the experiment and trying to make meaning out of the data that they collect. Uh, if you go back to the bleach lab that we did earlier, when I had students brainstorm their procedure, they all had different procedures at the end of it. I don't actually even give them a written procedure because as a class, we came up with the procedure. So if you can get kids to actually develop procedures for themselves with your guidance, with your expertise to steer them in the right direction, I think you can make it a much more valuable learning experience for your students. So this doesn't mean that every single experiment that you do has to be inquiry. In fact, I really don't think it should be. The human brain thrives on novelty, and when we learn information, we learn what is new and interesting. But there are times that you can actually take labs that are much more procedural directed and use those to build skills for students, but still allow them to foster the understanding of inquiry and questioning. So I'm actually going to set up an experiment for you that I do with my advanced chemistry class every single year. Uh, it's the determination of our lab. It's completely uh, teacher directed. I give them a set of very detailed instructions, and it's a completely confirmational lab. I tell them what they're solving for. They follow the procedure. They already know the value of R, but I think that it was useful for them to see where the value of R actually can come from experimentally. So I'm actually going to set up this experiment for you just so you can see um, what is involved. Uh, I am using hydrochloric acid, so I'm just going to grab a couple of uh, gloves here. Um, so in this lab, they just take a, a pre-masked uh, amount of magnesium. You can do this uh, either with a ruler if you don't have access to analytical balances. Uh, I actually have my students measure their magnesium on an analytical balance because uh, I have a couple of them in my room. Um, but they mask the amount of magnesium, and then they make a little cage out of copper wire. And I just have my students do it by wrapping the copper around the magnesium. And then they fill a udiometer tube with about five milliliters of hydrochloric acid, and then fill the rest of the udiometer tube with some water. So I'll have my cage set up and ready to go, because as soon as you invert the udiometer tube, you need to make sure that everything is all set up and ready to go. So they just wrap the copper around the magnesium, and then put it into a one-hole stopper that's designed to fit with your udiometer tube. Uh, and I use a burette clamp for this. Utility clamps work fine as well. Uh, and I'm just going to measure out about five milliliters of the hydrochloric acid. Uh, I'm using six molar for this, but you certainly could use double the volume and half the concentration. All right, so I've got five mils. And then very carefully, you just want to drizzle down uh, a little bit of distilled water or deionized to fill up the rest of the tube. And, uh, and this is really important not to have an air bubble. Uh, one of the things that students commonly do as a mistake here is they, leave, they don't quite fill it all the way to the top because they don't want to make a mess. And I tell them it's more important to get good data than to have a clean lab table. Uh, and so if you set it up correctly, some water should sort of spurt out when you're uh, putting the stopper back on, and that's good. That means there's no air bubbles there. And then I have them invert everything into just a beaker of regular tap water. And then we clamp it with the burette clamp. And then because the hydrochloric acid is a little bit more dense, it's going to start to settle down. Um, they eventually start to notice some hydrogen gas bubbling up. Now, this lab I am not using to build inquiry skills per se. Uh, it's completely uh, teacher directed. I give them every single data point that they need to have other than they have to collect the volume of the gas themselves. Um, I'm using this lab to build a skill set. So I want kids to know how to measure uh, gas volumes over top of a liquid, how to use Dalton's law of partial pressures to subtract out the water vapor that they're collecting there. Um, and then when they do the lab analysis, though, I'm getting them in the lab analysis to start to think about other ways to modify this experiment or to make this experiment more precise. And so I give them, as part of their lab experiment, they do a formal lab write-up, they record all their data, they you know, calculate and do all the processing. But then I give them some error analysis steps. And I've 
um, over the years started to go away from detailed error analysis where the students just you know give me three errors and what outcome it would have on the experiment. Um, I just got tired of reading the human error, I messed up, I measured wrong. Um, those I didn't thought think really gave great insight into how to do better experimental design. So instead, I give my students five errors that could go wrong in this experiment. So as the hydrogen gas is generated, it starts to bubble up. And I say, what would happen to the outcome of this experiment if some of the hydrogen hydrogen gas doesn't actually rise to the top, but it sort of clings to the walls of the container? Or what would happen if you used a little bit more magnesium? What if you used you know, four centimeters instead of three centimeters of magnesium? Or less magnesium, what would happen if you had two to three? Would the outcome be different, or would the ratio R be the same? And so I give them things that they can then analyze later on. By doing that, though, I'm actually getting them to start to think about experimental design and how would you improve this procedure and how can you overcome some of the errors. And then other things you can do, you can build that extension part directly into your laboratory. You can say, hey, what would happen if you actually put zinc in place of magnesium? What would you have to do to this experiment if you use zinc metal instead of magnesium metal? Or what would happen if you used a carbonate salt instead of using a metal at all? Would this experiment still work? What modifications to the procedure would you have to make? If you wanted an additional level of precision, if you wanted one more significant figure, what would you have to do to make this experiment work that way? And there's lots of ways that you can take, even if you have a lab that is completely student or completely teacher directed, where the procedure is handed to them, you can still work on building those inquiry and analysis skills after the laboratory through, inter through very purposeful questioning to getting to kids to understand the limitations of their experiment as well as what the outcomes of the experiment would be like if there were common errors made as part of the procedure. The nice part about this method of error analysis is that you can change what the errors are every single year. There's any number of possible things that could go wrong with this setup that you easily could question students and say, what outcome would this have if you actually tried to calculate R? Would R be too high? Would it be too low? And so by building, even with your completely conformational labs, you can still start to build inquiry skills at the end of the lab as they're working on that discussion, as they're working on their elaboration of the experiment.